What's happening, internet land? This is Jingles, and I'm out in beautiful Sedona, Arizona on a nice little ride today. Came down from Flagstaff, where it was going to get only going to be a high of 45 degrees or so, and in 45 minutes, it warmed up 15 to 20 degrees to a beautiful 55, 60 degrees, perfect riding conditions. But just took a stop, because I just hit dirt road, and I need to depressurize my tires. I need to adjust my suspension on the RX4, which is relatively simple. Just get out my tool kit, just get a flathead screwdriver, bring that down, and the same thing with the rear shock down here. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go out on a ride today. My buddy, who I normally ride with, uh, he has to rebuild his carburetor. Luckily, mine is fuel injected, so I do not need to do that. Um, at least don't need to do any sort of fuel maintenance as often. Um, so I won't be riding as hard as I normally do today because I don't want to get hurt and if I do get hurt I want it to be minimal um, But I'll take you guys out on a ride on the RX4 um, And we'll see how it handles these roads out here and I can kind of show you What the good things and the bad things are of having this bike on this sort of terrain But let's go ahead and get this party started. Booyah What's happening everybody? Uh, I've decided to do a little review video here uh, for the RX4 and kind of discussing why I chose the RX4 and why I'm still very happy that I chose the RX4. I don't have any new footage that I've taken. All this footage is from like a month ago. So we're going to have that in the background as I'm kind of talking about it here. But just know that that footage has nothing to do with what I'm talking about except that it's the bike operating on some awesome dirt roads out there. But anywho... Thank you all for uh, commenting on my blog and giving me, you know, some to work off of here. If it was just me rambling, that would fucking suck. Uh, <coughs> so, I mean, Jay Littleton, I'm pretty sure you work for CSC. Uh, I, I remember that name. Uh, thank you for replying to some of the comments on there. Super appreciated getting people in there. But there was a recent comment from uh, what Motorhead Redo. Uh, finally someone reviewed one of these. Why did you choose this bike over the Japanese Dual Sport? I think some Kawasaki dealers still have KLR 650s for sale and there are several other Japanese 650s and 250s on the market for the price close to a new RX4. That is a wonderful question. The reason that I chose the RX4 number one is because I like the underdogs. I'm always rooting for the underdogs. I was an underdog growing up, and I feel like I've become extremely successful. And so I root for underdogs because I, I want them to get ahead. Um, I believe in Chinese manufacturing. I believe that they are kind of the next big manufacturer in the world. I think it'll help out a lot of people in poverty over there um, come out of poverty because it's going to be great manufacturing jobs. But just for the ethics and the morals of it, I want to support the Chinese economy in that way. And for those of you that say, oh, the Chinese government, you know, people are different from their government, just like here in the United States, we are different from our government. Don't judge an individual in China over their government. Anywho, um, I decided to go for the underdog. That's one of the reasons why I chose the RX-4. Now let's go ahead and compare the RX-4 to the KLR-650. I have ridden many KL KLR-650s, um, and they are amazing dirt bikes. Um, they are okay road bikes. Uh, and that is the reason that I chose the RX-4. The RX-4 is an amazing road bike and an okay dirt bike. I wanted something that can get me easily to the different trails all across the United States and North America. And then once I got to those dirt roads, maybe I'd have to work just a little bit harder. Rather than have this awesome thing that can go, uh, like a, K a KLR650 that can go awesome and amazingly off-road with the big 21-inch front wheel, 19-inch back wheel, can roll over things, uh, has, a, what, 30 to 40% more suspension than the RX4. But, all of a sudden, when a majority of my time is being spent on the highways to get to this dirt road, I'm extremely uncomfortable. I'm sitting higher off the ground. Uh... Uh, any crosswind is going to blow me over. Like, if you've never ridden a KLR650 at 90 miles an hour, whew, let me tell you something. It takes a lot of concentration to keep that bike up straight, up moving forward, um, and not swaying from side to side, especially when you're passing semi-trucks, which are everywhere. Everywhere in the United States, because we do not have a good train system. Um, so that's the reason that I chose the RX4 over the KLR650. Are there moments when I am off-road that I wish I had a KLR650 again, and I could like bomb down this thing? Absolutely, I would have way more fun on particular sections of off-road. 
But on other sections of off-road, the RX-4 works just as well as the KLR650. And on-road is always better than the KLR650. So, 90% of the time, I am way happier that I have an RX-4. And that 10% of the time that I wish I had a KLR650, I might have to put in a little bit more work into the RX-4, a little bit more riding skill into the RX-4. Um, but it's worth it because it can still do what the KLR650 does. I just need to work a little bit harder 10% of the time. Not too bad. Um, why did I get other Japanese 650s and 250s on the market when the price is close to a new RX-4? I'm not sure which Japanese 650s and 250s you're looking at, but I do have a friend who is currently looking at the CB500X uh, from Honda. That might be one of the ones that you're referring to. So let's go ahead and directly compare the RX-4 to the CB500X from Honda. CB500X, oh, I think it's about a $6,000 bike. Uh, let's see, CB500X. I forget what the price is here. I'm just looking it up. They're probably going to skip past this because you guys don't want to hear it. All right, base price, $6,699 for a CB500X. A new RX-4 is $5,000 on the dock. Um, let's just go ahead and look directly across from what you get brand new on a CB500X and what you get on an RX-4. All right, CB500X, cast wheels. Eek. No good for off-road riding. Uh, spoke wheels are going to be way better, way more fixable. As I said in my other video, um, I've already had to fix my wheels on my RX-4 because I took some hard hits. I was pushing the shit out of that thing. Um, I bottomed out the suspension a whole bunch. And so I bent my wheels. Really, really easy fix, though. They didn't crack, which is what would happen to cast wheels if I absolutely pushed the shit out of that bike. If I push out the shit out of the CB500X and I cracked a wheel, replacing that wheel, we're talking four or five hundred bucks, guys. Getting my wheel straightened. $60, $70 a wheel. Really good deal. Um, that price difference, my goodness. $1,700 price difference over the RX-4. $1,700 of a $5,000? I mean, dang, you're talking paying 25% more, 30% more for a bike that does just about the same thing. Doesn't make much sense to me. Um, they're both fuel injected. We're good there. Uh, something I will say I like about the CB500X a whole bunch more. It has about 20% more suspension. Six inches of travel on the front and back versus five inches of travel on the front and back. That's nice. Um, is it worth 1700 bucks to get 20% more suspension? No. Uh, I would much rather just upgrade entirely and probably get an Africa Twin. Uh, or get some just really big boy bike if I'm constantly bottoming out and want to push the shit out of this thing. 20% more not going to make a big difference. Uh, I need double the suspension if I really want to start pushing this thing a lot harder. Um, on top of that, the CB500X, if I were to try to get a rack for it, so it has no engine guards in the front, has no good skid plate on the bottom. If I were to try to add all these things and then panniers to it, oh, we're looking at a probably $8,000, $8,500 bike now um, with tax. Uh, and out the door with a RX-4, I'm going to have engine guards. If I choose to go ahead and put the plastic paneer boxes on the back and the skid plate on it, I'm looking at only $5,900, and it's delivered to my front door, which is very nice because I live uh, in Flagstaff, Arizona, and there's not a good dealership up here um, to go look at adventure bikes. Uh, no diss to you, local dealership, but your prices are outrageous. Um, but yeah, looking at the direct difference between the two, it's just a much better deal to go for the Chinese bike. Like, okay, Honda's very reliable. That doesn't mean that the RX-4 is not reliable. They can't go that way. It hasn't been proven that it's not reliable, but I mean, I'm 2,500 miles in and I'm finding it pretty dang reliable. Um, <laughs> so all it takes is a little bit of time. Is it a gamble? Yeah. Is it a big gamble? No, to get the RX-4. Um, so I decided to go ahead and do it. Um, that's why I chose the RX-4 over CB500X, which is, I think, the Japanese bike that you're referring to. Not 100% sure, but, yeah. Um, so thank you very much for your comment. That is why I decided to go for it. Um, underdog, very good street riding capabilities, decently good off-road riding capabilities. If you're a good rider, you can push it. You can push the RX-4 really hard. 
Um, and then I just like the price over any of the Japanese bikes a whole bunch more. Um, and I do not believe people when they say Chinese bikes aren't reliable. And these people probably have never owned a Chinese bike because they believe that they're unreliable. So what sort of logic are they speaking from? Or hearsay are they speaking from? Uh, I didn't want to go off of anybody's opinion because it is just that, an opinion. And now I've formulated some facts about the RX-4 because those facts mean a lot to me. Uh, and it works. It's great. It's reliable. It's awesome. I kick butt. I fly down the road at 95 miles an hour, and I'm off-road flying at 15 to 30 miles an hour. And on single track, I might be only going 8 to 10 miles an hour. But am I doing the single track? Am I taking little half-foot to one-foot drops and popping the bike over it? Yeah. Does it bottom out the suspension? Yeah. Um, <coughs> but I'm able to do it. And that's only maybe 1% of my riding ever does that. And after I take a trail that's like that, I know not to take that trail again. I just wanted to go explore it. So that is the reason that I went for it. So let's go ahead and go through some of these other comments here. Uh, can I learn the bike to use to, to learn off-road riding? Um, that's a very general question. You could ask that about every bike. So we're not going to do that in this. Better 50-50 tires would improve the off-road capabilities. Oh, dude, I know. Well aware of it, Robert Fox. Thank you for making that... Uh, I can't wait to get those tires, but I'm not going to buy new tires when my old ones are just as good, or the new, uh, the, the ones that came with the bike are just as good. So I'm waiting to wear those down 2,500 miles in, and uh, they're doing great. Before I got another 2,500, uh, 2,000 maybe more after that, uh, before they're actually worn in and I got to replace new tires. And then when I do get new tires, I'm looking at the Shinko 804, 805s. Uh, cheap, good. You guys know me, I'm cheap. Uh, so to get those cheap tires and then yeah my off-road riding is going to go way up and because they're off-road tires i'm going to be able to bring that pressure down a good little bit so i'm going to get a little bit more cushion out of them probably you know half inch to an inch more of uh quote unquote suspension from my tires being less uh how does it ride on the highway any issues cruising 70 75 miles an hour as a single cylinder is it buzzy at those speeds thanks james yanish uh it is great at 70 to 75 i mean most of the time on the Arizona highways where the speed limit is 75, I'm going 85 to 90, except where I know the coppers hang out, because I know I've been driving these roads my entire life. I know exactly where they are. They're always in the exact same spots. So, then I slow down to 75. But I mean, at 85 miles an hour, I'm feeling great. How's the buzzing? Slim to none. Uh, the handlebars feel great. They come with bar end weights, which, ex which help out extremely uh, with any buzzing that's going to be on there. And it is a single cylinder engine, but it is counterbalanced. So as opposed to like, let's just uh, uh, compare it to a KLR 650, extremely buzzy at highway speeds, um, as well as you sitting higher off the ground, it's just not that comfortable with any crosswinds. Because the RX-4 is a counterbalanced engine, it feels extremely good. Um, at highway speeds. I don't get too much buzzing. On the foot pegs, I get more buzzing than on the handlebars, but you just put in those little rubber squishy things in your in your foot pegs, and then you don't feel them on your boots as much. Plus, good boots that have a lot of cushioning, uh, those those help out with uh, the, the, the peg vibration as well. So I feel great at 70 to 75. Uh, 70 to 75 miles an hour in fifth gear, I have plenty of power to get up to 85. As soon as I'm at 85 miles an hour, um, I want to switch to sixth gear. I have absolutely no power at 85 miles an hour in 6th gear. In fact, 6th gear has almost no power whatsoever. whatsoever. But, I mean, cruising at 85 in 6th gear, I'm at, I think if I remember right, 6,500 to 7,000 RPM, and the power band is right there. Um, and it doesn't redline until 9,000, and even if it redlines at 9,000, I got about 3,000 after that to push. Uh, so I probably could get to 100, 105. My maximum speed so far has been 99 um, miles per hour, and I just kind of don't want to go quicker than 99 miles an hour because this bike is not built for that. So if you want to ask somebody about creating a top speed uh, video, that ain't me. Uh, I don't want to push it past 100 miles an hour. Not has nothing to do with the bike, has everything to do with how I feel about safety uh, on the road. Oh, let's see, what else do we got? Let's see, thank you for uploading, thoughts, good thousand miles, yada yada yada. Uh, rubber seal treatment. Thank you, Jay. I will do a rubber seal treatment on that. Yeah, rubber can dry out. I especially know that here living in Arizona. My God, does everything dry out really quick, which is awesome. 
uh, for clothes and other things like that and refrigerators and moisture and not having to worry about any sort of mold or anything like that ever in our state. Um, but yeah, dries out rubber. I need to make sure I keep it nice and up to date. Uh, Armor All is my best friend. Uh, let's see, thanks for the update. Looking for more updates, update anyone myself, a real world view. Keep updating. Well, that's what I'm doing here, guys. Um, 2100 RPM is way high for an hour. Way high. 1100 is normal. Okay, let's touch on the RPMs for a second here. When I first got the bike, it was idling at about 2500 uh, RPM. Something to note about this is I'm taking all of these measurements at 7,200 feet in elevation. That's where I live. Um, so the RPM is going to be higher because there's less oxygen in the air. Way less oxygen in the air. Um, that idle has gone all the way down to about 1,400, 1,300 RPM now that the engine is fully broken in. Uh, when I first start the bike, it might start at 2,100 RPM, but as soon as it's warmed up, uh, the EFI recognizes that it is warm, which is a great indication that it's a good electronic fuel injection unit, and it drops it down to about 13 to 1400 here um, at 7,200 feet. When I'm down in Phoenix, uh, which is about 2,000 feet elevation, it drops down to about 1200, 1100 RPM. Um, so I agree with you, 21 R uh, 2100 RPM is way high for an idle, uh, but it has decreased. And it was probably that high because it was a brand new bike and it was at higher elevation. Um, and it is working much better now. Uh, something that I will say, riding at high elevation, uh, here's another reason why I chose to get it over a KLR 650. Uh, high mountain passes and elevation differences, which if you've never visited Arizona, uh, that's the way that it is. We have... Uh, I mean, down in Phoenix, you're looking at 2,000 foot elevation. In other parts of Arizona, you might be at 1,000 foot elevation. And in other parts of Arizona, you might be at 9,000 feet elevation. Um, so you are constantly going up and down and up and down throughout this state. Uh, it has a lot of mountains, snow, and other things like that. So I'm constantly going up and down. If I had a carbureted engine and I was constantly having to adjust the idle, my god, that would suck. I might have to adjust it three times in a singular day where I was riding 500 miles. On a fuel injected, never have to worry about that. Um, never had to adjust a damn thing on this bike, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so that's uh, another reason why I chose to go for it over over the KLR650. Um, as for other things about the bike, I will say that I've had to tighten some bolts on it. Um, but again, I think I would have to do that even with the Honda bike. I've been riding the crap out of this thing. I have dropped it, what, six times now. Um, when you drop things, it's going to shake it up. When you drop a 500-pound object with fuel in it, uh, and gear, and everything else, um, it's going to loosen some bolts. And so, yeah, I've had to tighten some things. Uh, but again, I, I, I think I would have to do that with any bike that I'm riding the way that I'm riding. As a 200-pound rider... Uh, Taking it off little one foot pops and other things and dropping it a whole bunch. Yeah, I'm gonna have to tighten things. It has nothing to do with it being a Chinese bike. You're acting like the chi a, a, a China man's arm is going to be not as strong as a Japanese person's arm. It has nothing to do with that. If you're talking about manufacturing quality, if you're saying that China can't manufacture threads of a bolt correctly or as good as Japan. Uh, well, one, those screws probably are manufactured in the same at, at the, in the same facility somewhere they're probably the exact same screws um but to think that there's a huge difference in that aspect of chinese bikes over japanese bikes i'm sorry you're an idiot um you're an idiot that, that's all i have to say about that now when we're talking about engine quality and manufacturing of those things that probably are manufactured in actual china or actual japan yes there will be differences and would a 450cc uh, Japanese bike feel more powerful than this uh, uh, RX-4? Yeah, it absolutely would feel a lot more powerful. But here's a little unknown fact, or that a lot of a lot of people don't know. The RX-4 uses a 1977 designed Japanese motorcycle engine. So, what, 1977 to 2020? You're talking 40 years of progression to go into the CB500X. So. Does the CB500X, even though it's only 50 cc's more as a 500 cc engine, feel a heck of a lot more powerful than the RX-4? Yeah, it has 40 more years of technology built into it. But 
That 1977 engine works really well, is really reliable. It's been used for 40 years and is one of the best engines that has ever been built. So when we're talking about reliability of the engine, yeah, the RX-4 is pretty gosh darn legit. Um, <coughs> what else do we got here, guys? Um, to this random person uh, that ha just has a picture of a beautiful woman, I one, I don't believe that that's you. Um, two, I want to buy a motorcycle, either a Harley or a Sport, but I've only had a scooter. I would like to upgrade with a better one, but problem is I don't know about shifts. What motorcycle would be good for me? A motorcycle class would be good for you. Um, I am not going to even reply or give any more thought into that comment. Sorry if you're offended. Also, not sorry if you're offended. If you're asking very generic questions like that about a blog about a very specific bike, you're a moron. Go do your research about how to ride a motorcycle and make comments on that video, not a video about a generic motorcycle, you goddamn idiot. Um, whew, let's see here. Thank you for uploading, reviews in the future. You know, I think I've, I've touched upon everything. The, the, main th the main point that I'm trying to make across here that you should see in the video down below is this bike is capable. This bike is great. This bike is going to get me across the country. Shit, I might be the first person to take it from Alaska down to Patagonia. Um, we'll have to wait and see. And if I do do that video, here's the final note. If I call CSC, California Scooter Company, and I let them know that I'm about to do this, I bet you they would back me. I bet you they would expect a phone call from me if I broke down somewhere. And I bet you that they would ship me the parts. Would I have to pay for it? Yeah. Would I have to pay for a Honda bike? Yeah. Um, but... Steve Snyder, um, and everybody that's at CSC, they're wonderful people. They're supportive people. I had a bout of uh, 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 frustration with them, and that was my own emotional, uh, personal life coming through in a conversation, and I, I'm super sorry, CSC, that you had to deal with that. Um, but they dealt with it. They dealt with it extremely well, to the point to where the owner of the company, Steve, gave me a personal phone call and chatted with me for like 20 minutes about why he did this, what he's excited about, and how to go about it. I do not think the CEO of Honda would ever call me. Now, I know that those that's a very indirect comparison, but that's how I feel about it. Like, I am supported by these guys. They're wonderful. Every time I've asked them a, me a mechanical question, they've gotten back to me in less than 48 hours. 48 hours of the direct person that built my bike, put it together here in the United States, to hitting me up, knows every nut and bolt, contacting me back is so valuable. My mechanic down the street might have to look up the schematic of the bike. The mechanic that I can email or call any day of the week and get a response from that knows every single bolt and nut on the bike that makes the instruction videos and he replies to me, that's valuable. That's ethics. That's how a company should be run. All these people are bashing CSC and they shouldn't be. They're a wonderful company. Have you talked to them? Have you rode one of their bikes? Or are you just bashing them off of hearsay? Because if you're just bashing them off of hearsay, you're an asshole. Um, get your facts straight. Call them. Talk to them. Ride one of their bikes. Go test ride it. Do something that's actually concretely, scientifically factual. And don't just rant about your emotions. Um, so, I love CSC. When I take it, if I take it, because that's a lot of time off. Uh, if I take it from Alaska down to Mexico, or down to uh, South America, God, I just think South and I immediately think Mexico. That's kind of uh, messed up. <coughs> but anywho, if I take it down that way, I think that if I called CSC, they'd be ready on a moment's notice to ship me apart. Um, I could, f I might have to wait a week for it to get to me, but it would get to me. Um, any other parts that I've had to ask for from CSC, they've gotten to my house here in the United States within like four days. Um, if I ask them to expedite it down to South America, I bet it might take a week, week and a half of me sitting there, but whatever, that's a part of an adventure. That's only if something crazy breaks down that is very specific to CSC. Something I can fix with duct tape or some welding or whatever else it may be. Um, I could probably just ask a guy down there to do it for me, because uh, being friendly goes a long ways, and people are going to help you out when you're on an awesome adventure. So, I think I can do the Patagonia push. I think I will do the Patagonia push one day. I think I love this bike, 
Anywho, I've been ranting a while. I hope you all enjoy this video and everything that you've seen in the background as I go through it. Um, feel free to comment down below, uh, and I'll continue posting videos as I go throughout this process. Anywho, this is Jingles, and I'll catch you all later.